call the meeting to order. So glad that you're here for our final meeting of the year. And uh, we will not be approving the minutes today because they're still in the process of being transcribed. It was a very quick transcription period, so we will be approving them at the first meeting next year. Uh, that was also the case last year, so this is nothing new. Um, we'll begin the meeting with the State of the University address by our interim president, Bob Berdahl. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, I appreciate being here today at the final meeting uh, of the Senate uh, for this year and presumably my final meeting uh, with the University Senate as well. Uh, since we expect the new president to be in place uh, no later than September 15th because I'm leaving on September 15th and perhaps if we're lucky the new president will be in place even before then. Uh, if, if you're lucky, and I'm especially lucky, that will, uh, that will in fact, I think, occur. Uh, but let me uh, welcome new members uh, to the University Senate and to thank uh, those of you uh, who are on the Senate whose membership is uh, expiring, terms are expiring, uh, and to thank you for your service uh, to the University. Um, I've said repeatedly that I think a strong Senate and shared governance is an important component of successful universities. Uh, and indeed, I think that is clearly the case. And I thank all of you who have been serving so well on this body for your service. Let me just update you on a few of the events that will be happening, I think, in the months uh, ahead. Uh, on June 18th, of course, we will celebrate uh, one of the great annual traditions of any university, and that's our commencement. Uh, the quality of the graduating class, the percentage of graduates that we have this year as uh, it reflects, I think, the great work over the past several years to attract good students, some of the best students that we possibly can. Uh, and I recognize as well, because of the uh, really substantial growth of enrollment that this campus has uh, witnessed over the last several years. The importance of all of the faculty who have taken on additional burdens, have larger classes uh, and more advisees and all of the rest of the things that go with that, uh, with that remarkable uh, growth in, of an enrollment. Uh, the burdens that it imposes on the faculty and on the staff as well. So uh, thank all of you, thanks to all of you for your tremendous support for these students who will be receiving their degrees in June and for those who will be continu continuing their education going forward. Uh, we also will be having, as you know, the Bach Festival on campus, new exhibits at the Schnitzler Museum of Art that are open. Uh, and we are preparing as well for the uh, Olympic track and field trials that have uh, been planned for <coughs> the uh, University of Oregon uh, as host, um, and you'll be reading more about those uh, and the opportunities that they present as well to the university and to the, the community. We're honored as well this summer to host the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, this is an association of 40-odd universities, 40-some universities, they're not all odd, uh, universities uh, that, um, that surround the Pacific Basin. Uh, I was part of the initial group of, of presidents and chancellors who organized this, this back in 1997 when I was at Berkeley. Uh, and it consists of the AAU <coughs> universities on the West Coast, those in California, Oregon uh, is the only one in Oregon and the University of Washington, as well as some other international universities from British Columbia all the way around the Pacific Rim. Uh, and I appreciate the work that many of our colleagues are doing in preparation uh, for that meeting. Um, as you know, uh, we are in the midst of a search uh, closing in, I think, on the final list of candidates for the presidency. I have to say that I think that's gone 
uh, to date, at, at least exceedingly well. Uh, one of the things that I looked forward to when I came as interim would be to provide a bit of assistance to that search process where I could be of help. Uh, and I'm very pleased at the process that has been undertaken, the really leadership role played by the faculty and staff and students serving on that search committee, uh, and, uh, and just listening to the conversation about the candidates has been, I think, very edifying, and you will undoubtedly, I think, be uh, pleased at the outcome, uh, which is not yet determined, but just looking at the list of finalists who've been uh, I think identified, you can be very confident in the quality of people uh, who will be considered for that position. Uh, Provost Bean is set to return to his position on July uh, 1st uh, and will transition back uh, in the course of the month of June as well. And in addition, uh, Yvette Marie Alex Asenio uh, will be, Asenso will be uh, joining us as the Vice President for Institutional Equity and Inclusion in early August. We expect the campus enrollment to be around 25,000 in the fall, uh, reflecting an uptick in international students uh, and in, uh, in non-resident students as well. Uh, and we have work to do, I think, to increase the yield rate for Oregon's best and brightest uh, I think it's very important that we uh, keep uh, a strong contingent of students coming to this, to this university from the state of Oregon. Um, the next president will face some significant challenges. They're not unique challenges, uh, I think, because clearly the, the level of support for this university has been declining from the state for some period of time and next year will be a low point in terms of the state subsidy of, uh, of our budget. Uh, so there'll be a financial challenge that is clearly there. I think there will also be a, a challenge in the new structure of, of relationship uh, of the campus to a newly created union. Um, that will have an effect on how we think about governance itself, uh, and obviously some of the functions that have been typically performed in the context of shared governance uh, will shift into uh, some of the deliberations that surround a union. Uh, it, is, it, it is, it seems to me, going to be extremely challenging for a new president to deal with a new structure of relationship with faculty through a union at the same time that we maintain the structure of shared governance that has been typical uh, of this university. Uh, a union and its relationship to an administration, especially in the course of an initial contract discussion, can be contentious, it can be adversarial, uh, and it can be very, very difficult for both sides uh, of the table to cope with. Uh, I think it's essential as we enter a new year, as we enter a new term of a new president, that we focus strongly on, uh, on, on a degree of comity that is essential for us to be able to, to function together as a university in these new circumstances that the degree of interactions are those of respect, mutual respect on both sides of the table, and respect for those who are not supportive of the union, as well as for those who are in the union. Uh, and respect for the administration, which will be navigating between uh, many of these very difficult issues with a portion of the faculty uh, in the union, not enthusiastic about it, another portion in the union enthusiastic about it, another portion of the faculty that is not a part of the union. Those are all difficult moments to get past. Uh, and it will be very important, it seems to me, uh, for everyone to pull together to support and make certain that this transition, which is, uh, I think, going to be challenging for anyone, 
to get past it with uh, a degree of community that is uh, a high point for the university and a sense of community that is not uh, destructive of the relationships that are essential for a university to feel, really feel like a community. So I, I plead with you and ask you uh, to go forward in that spirit in this new set of relationships. Uh, it is, I think, vital to the well-being uh, of the university uh, as we go forward. So uh, I've been honored, I think, very much to serve with you over the last five months. Uh, I returned to this university. I said when I came back uh, that I was not the second coming. I was simply coming back for a second time. I think I have probably proved that to you uh, in the course of, uh, uh, of the five months that I've been here. Uh, but let me simply say that it has been a privilege and an honor uh, to be back at the university, and I appreciate uh, the good and hard work that you all do on behalf of what I think to be a very fine university. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob. In my comments, I would like to first commend Bob Berdahl in a variety of ways and talk about our agenda for next year, um, which is going to be one of the most important years in the history of the university. And I think so much of what we will be doing comes out of the leadership that uh, Bob has given us over these past few months. I would like to talk about that in some detail, although not for too long of a period of time. This has been a year like no other, as all of you know, and one that we will never forget. Um, in many ways, it's redefined who we are and what our university is, and we're still in the transition of becoming who we truly can be, the highest of what we truly can be. We're aiming toward that, we're striving for it, and the only way we're gonna get there is together. It's got to be that way. There is no other way forward. And we have to remember that. Unionization is one thing. But respectful dialogue, respect for each other, respect for our differences, we must remember this at all times, no matter what we're doing, apart from uni unionization and within that transition as well. We began the year with an inspiring president, and we ended with an inspiring interim president. The Senate would like to commend Bob Berdahl with these words. On behalf of the University Senate, I am writing to express our gratitude for your vision and leadership as the interim president of the University of Oregon. We are deeply grateful for all of your work at the university especially in regard to the agenda that you set upon your arrival in January 2012. Faculty recruitment and retention, the presidential search, the capital campaign, and independent governing boards. Thank you for offering your guidance and wisdom to us, which will enable us to better educate our students and to serve the highest interests of our institution and the state of Oregon. With gratitude and respect, University of Oregon Senate. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, I want to thank you, Rob. This means a great deal to me, this too. Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate this, um, this very much, and uh, good luck. I have another meeting that I've got to get to with students right now, so I'm going to be leaving. But uh, uh, I hope you all have a wonderful summer. Uh, come back refreshed and ready to tackle all the challenges of the next academic year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Well, the principal achievements of our year, as I see it, uh, the ratification of our new constitution, 
the establishment of our policy on policies, both of which have allowed us to move forward in a certain way. And, and uh, then the passage and signing of four policies in 2012, um, all of which would not have been possible without Bob's guidance and help. The retirement and emeriti policy, the research misconduct policy, the classified research policy, and the proprietary research policy. All very important. Uh, we need these policies, especially the research policies needed to be in place by the end of this year. And um, as you know, the Constitution was only signed as of December 15th. The policy on policy is the same. Um, so to have achieved the signing of these four policies in the brief time from the February meeting to today is quite an achievement. However, we have a lot more work ahead of us, and next year uh, we have three very important policies that we need to be working on with the new president. Uh, those are academic freedom and freedom of speech policy, the facilities use policy, and the legal services policy. Bob Burdell has been very gracious and said that he would work with me over the next month on these policies to set the stage for then working further with them uh, um, with the new president. This is very important because the first two, academic freedom and freedom of speech and facilities use, uh, are some of the most important matters uh, to all of us. The facilities that we use, what the strictures are regarding those facilities, so forth and so on. And of course, there is nothing more important than academic freedom and freedom of speech. The history of those policies so that everybody understands and we're on the same page about it is that these policies have gone through quite a few steps already. They were ultimately sent to President Le Riviere. Uh, he declined to sign these two policies. They were then revised substantially and sent back to their Senate committees. The firing intervened before President Le Riviere could come before us and do what is required, which is to explain his veto. Uh, this timeline is nobody's fault. There's no finger pointing to be done here. Once we had the policy on policies, as you know, in January, uh, we had an issue about adding a new member to the IAC. You know what that's about. You remember the last meeting and the discussion we had. What that meant is when Bob said he didn't want to sign any new charges or any new memberships uh, or any membership changes, um, I then went to him and discussed the 10 year review that we're in the process of doing of all university standing committees. And I said to him that if he didn't want to sign uh, or approve changes such as would certainly be made uh, in the standing committees, we would then postpone the 10th year review uh, to this next academic year, 2012, 2013. And he agreed. Uh, so that's what we did. But this also meant that we couldn't really move forward on these two policies either because they're of such a magnitude and such a nature that to try to do these uh, within the short period of time that we had wouldn't work either. So we set these off for next academic year as really the first item on our docket with our new president. And I just want everybody to understand that so that we're together as a community. Uh, once our Senate committees have reviewed these again, we will of course post them so everybody will be able to review them. Uh, each of you on your own, and we'll go forward with our process from there. Um, also, I'd like to say that the agenda that I read uh, when I gave Bob the uh, commendation uh, is actually very similar to at least three points from our agenda for next year. Uh, I think that three of the most important things that we will be striving to accomplish together, first, Faculty recruitment and retention is still a very important issue, of course, with an increased number of students at the university. Each search we do becomes so important and so crucial. Uh, that was one of the points that Bob directed us to in his first speech here before the Senate. So I'd like to reiterate that. That is one that remains for next year. Equally so was the presidential search, which now will become working in collaboration with our new president. And that's really crucial. Uh, to have a respectful dialogue with our new president from the beginning, honest and yet always and truly collaborative is something that we must remain focused on. Uh, as Bob has mentioned, and as I, I was li would like to emphasize now, I think it's crucial for the future of this university that we really cultivate 
a true collaboration between this body, the Senate, and the new president. Then third, another point from Bob's agenda uh, of the four points that he gave was working toward independent governing boards. And uh, I would say, and you know that the Senate is ready to do this and has been doing it, but now it will be a new legislative session in 2013 and we're ready to participate as appropriate. It's that as appropriate that hasn't been defined yet, how we will be included in the dialogue that is emerging. Um, I go to many of the meetings um, such as are appropriate, uh, for example, related to the achievement compacts and other matters, and I'll be uh, reporting back to the Senate about those and including you as often as possible uh, and, and keep giving you updates so that everybody uh, is well informed. So those were three points from Bob's agenda that in fact are an, a very important point, a uh, set of three points for our agenda next year. The next item uh, is the collective bargaining agreement. And here, as Bob has said, we're in a transition. And uh, as he has also said that in this effort to craft a meaningful, substantial, and truly helpful collective bargaining agreement, we must maintain our sense of community and go beyond that. I think we need to strengthen our sense of community through this process. So uh, I personally will collaborate with the union coordinating committee. Um, I'm hoping to begin discussions very soon about this process so that we understand it, so that I can keep everyone well informed in this body. And um, we will be glad to help, and of course we, we very much want to be helpful in the writing of the agreement, again, as appropriate. Uh, what that means is to be defined, of course, and uh, I think the Union Coordinating Committee has been clear about this. One of the phrases that I've heard that I really like is, the union will be what we will make it. <laughs> and I think I'm correct about that. <laughs> I'm seeing somebody who I know from the committee smiling, and I, I, I think that's true. And I think we can all be together on that. The union is what we will make it. And uh, we have to work together, whether we initially supported it or not, uh, coming together as a community, keeping the highest interests of the institution and the state of Oregon in mind as we do that. And obviously, the education of our students, I would say first and foremost. Then the 10th year review, I can't overstate how important this is and how I will be asking many of you to help with the 10th year review. Um, we're reviewing all university standing committees. The first time we did the review was 2010, 2011. It wasn't finished by the end of that year because there was more um, work to be done that the committees themselves couldn't do within the time that was available. When we moved it to this current year, uh, we were unable to accomplish what we needed by the time Richard was fired, and I just told you why it was being moved to next year. We will be conducting it again. We will wipe the slate clean. We will send out a new document to each chair of each committee and ask for input from the beginning so that we are clear that whatever has transpired in these past two years is factored into that 10th year review. We can't press the reset button and go back. We have to remain in the present and then go forward. So I want to apologize to every chair of every committee that there will be more work involved. But in order to do this accurately and well and to serve our community, we have to do it in this way. So uh, those documents will be coming uh, probably toward the end of the summer uh, possibly earlier, I'm going to ask the chairs if they would like to start work on that during the summer or wait until into September um, and, and see what timeline they would like. Um, also, I'm going to ask the chairs to please consult with committee members. If it's during the summer, it can be done by email, of course, but during the year would be um, in a meeting and probably best would be to have email correspondence during the summer, start the process, and then in the first several weeks, of the fall quarter, have a meeting, and try to finalize it so that we could get the reports in, certainly by October 15th, and go forward from there. It's the Committee on Committees that is charged with doing this 10th year review, but in collaboration with the committee chairs and membership of the committees. I very much look forward to it. I see this as a time of transition in this way, too, that we could really strengthen our system of shared governance by bringing our committee structure and our service structure in line with our highest goals and ideals. And this is the time for us to do it. I also think it will work very well with the process of unionization and I think it will work very well uh, with the 
striving toward uh, achieving the independent local governing boards. I think all those things can work together, and the Senate will endeavor to make that happen, a single motion, all, a unified motion toward uh, the creation of the university that we want, our university. Um, then I'd like to mention that, um, as many of you know, there have been some emails uh, that were meant to remain. I see some of you smiling, as well you should. They were meant to remain within the IAC boundaries, and uh, indeed, someone unnamed sent them to the whole Senate, to the Senate exec. So the cat's out of the bag. I have no trouble with that, as all of you know. <laughs> and we have some important issues to discuss. And rather than pointing fingers, which as you know, I don't like to do, I try never to do, um, we are going to proceed with action and due deliberation of three important points that were indeed raised by Bob Berdahl himself, and I think justifiably so. There have been some conflicts. Um, I don't think that I'm speaking out of turn now that everybody knows to say that Bob has had some dialogue uh, with Nathan Tublitz, chair of the IAC on the one hand, and Bill Harwood, chair of Senate Transparency Committee on the other hand. You saw some of that dialogue at the last Senate meeting with Bill. And uh, you had a taste of the dialogue with Nathan in the winter. What's emerged out of that process and out of these emails is a very healthy questioning it is going to help us to move forward on three important points, and there may be more, and I welcome you to write to me if you have ideas along these lines. The first is conflict of interest. This is absolutely crucial that we look into this. Um, this has been raised by Bob Berdahl. He's right to do so. Conflict of interest as it relates to committee service and Senate service. What does it mean? We don't really have any statutes or any guidelines that would help us in this regard, and we need to explore this and develop some. The second is correct mode of communication. What that has to do with is personal attacks. Those of you who got the emails know what I'm talking about. That there have been some email exchanges that have been rather heated and have gone over the line to such a point that personal animosity has arisen from these exchanges. I'm sorry, it's not acceptable. We can't have that. We can't be the community that we're aspiring to be with personal animosity flying in from any indiscriminate angle at any time. Uh, not that the people who wrote the emails were not considering what they said very well. I, I believe that they were, and they're people of integrity. But sometimes we get so excited and so passionate about what we believe that we lose sight of that basic sense of open dialogue and respectful dialogue. It can happen. It happens to me, I'm sure. I'm, you know, I've been in these situations. I'm sure you've been in these situations. We don't have to blame anybody. We don't have to go back into the past and point fingers. We don't have to play gotcha games. It's not necessary. We're mature people who can go forward on these issues together. And the second point of personal attacks, correct mode of communication, we must look at this as well. By the way, I'm going to give a way of going forward. I'm not just going to leave you with the points. The third point is absolutely crucial. It's leadership. Bob, very rightfully so, in one of the emails at the end, questioned the nature of the Senate leadership. I thought in a productive way. I thought that was very helpful. It was helpful to me to understand where he was coming from. I didn't mind in the least. I didn't respond by email because I wanted to work with you as a community to go forward. It's not only my leadership, but the leadership within the Senate, the past leadership, and how that relates to where we go in the future. Um, he may have had a different idea about how, for example, I should deal with the difficult situations that arose, whether I should take a stand, for example, as Senate president or not, or whether I should remain neutral. I chose to remain neutral. He may have another idea. It is 
absolutely essential that we have this dialogue with the leaders we respect most. And I can tell you Bob Berdahl is one of the leaders I respect most in higher education and in any field. I am so grateful that he has brought this up. We also have an issue of cultivating leadership. This year we had the largest number of responses for the Senate election. Uh, we absolutely filled the ballot. And the same for committee service. We had more than the requisite number uh, in each of the categories. This is fantastic. Now we need to go further and develop leadership so that in each decade of our community, we have leaders who are being trained, who are excited, who are devoted to our community and to our system, who believe in it, who when they see a need for reform, work with us for reform. So I want to see all of us together, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond working together, rather than having a kind of leadership that's getting older and older. And look, I just turned 60, so I'm pointing a finger here, right? It's a responsibility that we all work together to develop leadership across the academic generations, right? And so that's another point. Um, how are we going to do this? What I'm going to do is convene a certain number of the past Senate presidents, I'm calling that the President's Council for lack of a better term at the moment, with the Committee on Committees. And within that combined body, uh, we're going to look at these points and come back to the Senate with a report and see where we would like to go from there on these matters. I think these are really crucial and I think it's absolutely great that they've come up at this time uh, as we go into the various other efforts uh, that I've outlined and that Bob outlined before I did. I welcome all of you to participate in this process and you will have certainly opportunities to do that. My last comments have to be about this one topic, a time for service. You're needed more than ever and you're needed to help to establish what last year I said was the four C's but it's the six C's actually. First, communication with each other, within our units and across units. Then, community building. We have to build communities that are really strong and maintain our sense of community even as we might perceive divisive forces coming from various angles toward us. The community must be strong, community building. And then connectivity between our communities, making one greater community, connectivity. Then creativity, we have to allow ourselves to be creative and think outside the box and try to find new ways of doing things, like I'm proposing today. But you are all very creative people and I ask you to help me in this process and write to me when you have ideas, call me and have a dialogue with me, or let's get together for coffee and go at it. Uh, cooperation is next. In all things, we really need to develop an ongoing sense of cooperation. And finally, commitment. Commitment to our goals because without that, we won't have the follow through that we so greatly need. So I want to thank all of you again for reelecting me. I have to tell you this last year was one of the hardest ones in my entire life. Uh, the next one is not going to be a picnic by any means. But with your confidence and trust, I feel up to the task and I know that you're more than up to it. So together, as one community, uh, we are going to address these issues and move forward. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the work that we are going to be doing this year and in the future. Thank you. Now we get to a very, let's say, regular part of our agenda, which is the spring curriculum report. We have one of these per quarter, and I'd like to call Paul Engelking up to the podium to uh, enlighten us about the curriculum.
the correction screen folks. Okay, all, all of you, I think this works. All of you have ha seen uh, the um, preliminary curriculum report for spring of 12. Uh, we have a few corrections. Uh, it's been a busy term, as most spring terms are, and we've been trying to catch up. So I'd like to go through the corrections and additions to the uh, report, and then um, move that we accept the amended report. Um, so the first one is uh, Geography 491-591 Advanced GIS uh, 4. It should read Advanced Geographic Information Systems. Um, uh, three courses were removed from our pending list. Uh, we had trouble uh, finishing up business. Uh, we got it done. Uh, Philosophy 471-H Honors Thesis Workshop and Philosophy 475-H Honors Seminar. Um, and then also PS 375, Race, Politics, and the Law, and that's also approved to satisfy Social Science General Education Group and approved to satisfy American Culture's multicultural requirement. Uh, there's some administrative actions that, um, or corrections in here. Um, architectures, uh, 603 dissertation's been added. Um, ASL 399 Special Studies in Communication Disorders and Sciences, uh, existing course changes. Um, we add a prerequisite to ASL uh, 101. Uh, we also have some new course changes uh, here. Uh, OLIS 611 Sustainability Leadership Practicum. There was uh, one that was listed under AAA. And uh, OLIS, also OLIS 612 and 613. An administrative action, product design, we changed the prerequisite for that. Um, then uh, administrative actions are CFT uh, 622, relational assessments. Uh, there was a, um, a correction to these uh, on um, um, uniting, and they had R's in them. Um, and then in the last sections, other curricular matters, uh, Spanish 228 cannot be used to satisfy both the BA language requirement and the arts and letters group requirement. And then there are two ma fairly major sections in here that I might give you some time to read. Uh, these are in program changes. A minor program in South Asian studies uh, was approved by the undergraduate council and vice provost and approved by the provost, effective fall 2012. The School of Architecture and Allied Arts, uh, Masters of Architecture, option one, and Master of Interior Architecture, option one programs are discontinued and replaced with a Master of Science in Architecture and Master of Science in Interior Architecture. Um, no other changes to the degree requirements with this name change. Uh, approved by the Graduate Council and the Vice Provost for Graduate Studies, effective fall 2012. Then the Master of Architecture options two and three programs are merged into a single Master of Architecture program uh, with two tracks. Um, there is set a minimum credit for the two tracks at 87 and 144, and it was approved by the Provost upon recommendation of the Graduate Council in its effective fall th 2012. The School of Journalism and Communication, uh, uh, name of the Communication Society doctoral degree program and the affiliated master's degree program have been changed, doctor, master's degrees, excuse me, have been changed to media studies with the approval of the Dean of the School of Journalism and Communication and the endorsement of the Graduate Council and Provost. That's also effective fall 2012. So are there any corrections or amendments from the floor? Okay, if not, I would uh, recommend that the um, um, report for spring 2012 be approved as amended. I think you get to share the vote. Yes, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstain. 
Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for Thank all you. of your work and the work of your committee. We really appreciate it. I won't go up to the podium every time just to uh, move things along. So uh, now we get to the pleasurable part of the agenda, uh, the awarding of three major awards that the Senate gives each year. The first is the UO Senate Leadership and Service Award for Officers of Administration. And this year it will be presented to Rachel Rea, Assistant Dean of CAS, and the presenter is Sonia Runberg. Hello, my name is Sonia Rumberg, and I am a senator representing officers of administration. Today I'm honored to present the 2012 U of O Senate Leadership and Service Award for Officers of Administration. Created in 2011, this annual award recognizes an outstanding officer of administration for her or his exemplary service over a period of years to the university through participation in committees, advisory bodies, or elected positions and for inspired leadership and commitment to the principles of shared governance, participatory decision-making, and fostering a campus climate of inclusiveness, respect, and professional excellence. The U of O Senator, Senate Officers of Administration and the Officers of Administration Council served as the award committee, reviewed nominations, and forwarded their top nomination to the U of O Senate President, Bob Keir. At this point, I would like to invite the recipient of the 2012 U of O Senate Leadership and Service Award for Officers of Administration, Rachel Rea, Assistant Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, to join me. Rachel has been at the University of Oregon for over 20 years and has served in a wide variety of capacities, including the Officers of Administration Council, the Faculty Advisory Committee, and other advisory positions. She has demonstrated an enduring commitment to the university through her service and by her encouragement for all campus members to participate in governance. Her service has made profound contrib contributions to the welfare of this institution, and through this award, we wish to say thank you and congratulations. I would like to share with you some of the comments made in letters of nomination for Rachel to receive this award. Scott Coltrane, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, noted that he has worked with Rachel during the last three years, witnessing her profound contributions to the welfare of the institution, noting that her contributions began well before he arrived on campus. He would not be exaggerating to say that it is safe to assume that the influence of her contributions to the U of O will last well beyond her tenure on the job. She loves this place, and her service and leadership have enriched, enriched us all. Wendy Larson, Vice Provost for Portland Programs, added that Rachel has a deep understanding of the university and its multifaceted, many-layered structure. She also comprehends the elusive culture of the academic community, including faculty governance and the importance of democracy and wide participation in decision-making. She understands the community's various parts and through this knowledge is able to address a multitude of concerns. Daniel Pope, professor of history, stated that he was surprised to learn that Rachel hasn't already received this recognition, but her impending retirement marks an opportunity to honor a remarkable contributor to the University of Oregon community. John Crozier, former OAC member, added that during her tenure, Rachel has been a quiet, thoughtful, and effective leader whose well-reasoned ideas and proposals frequently con contributed significantly to the promulgation of policies that enhanced professional development and bolstered the efficiency and success of the disparate group of OAs who supervise, manage, administer, and work in confidential positions involving programs, people, resources, and facilities around campus. And finally, Mariana Nichols, former colleague in CAS, stated that a closer look reveals the remarkable generosity of Rachel's service contributions. They are far-reaching, well beyond her home departments, they are frequent, and they require a considerable amount of time. It is important to understand that Rachel's MO for service has been thoughtfulness over expediency. Before taking action, she carefully weighs potential consequences. Probably the most distinguishing hallmark of Rachel's service is attitude. Anyone who has ever worked with Rachel knows that she sets high standards for herself and expects others to live up to those standards as well. 
In closing, Rachel, this is a well-deserved award and is given in recognition of your tireless work and we, your friends, peers, and colleagues, wish to sincerely and most humbly say thank you. Thank you. you are very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I would first like to thank the Senate for creating awards to honor the service of both officers of administration and classified staff. These awards recognize the collaborative efforts of faculty and staff in making our university an inclusive and quality driven community of learning. I'm very fortunate because each of the three deans that I worked with in CAS believed it's important for all university employees to serve our community. I would like to thank them for their support and ongoing encouragement. I would also like to thank my colleagues who nominated me for these, this award. Hearing your remarks was very humbling. Uh, with our busy schedules, the extra work of writing a nomination letter can easily be put aside until the deadline has passed. But you valued my efforts and you made the time to nominate me. Thank you. I'm deeply honored to receive this award. It is recognition of the many hours spent on the Faculty Advisory Committee, the Officers of Administration Council, and other innumerable committees. Frankly, serving on a committee is time consuming and sometimes frustrating. I can remember one committee which met two hours per week for two years. <laughs> Somehow, my husband tuned into the schedule and on every Monday evening, I was greeted at the door with a glass of wine. <laughs> but committee service can also be enlightening. It broadens our perspective of the institution, helps us develop contacts beyond our regular circle, and offers the opportunity to make things better. We can't do that alone. And so my final thank you is to everyone who served with me on all of those committees. This award actually honors all of our service. Thank you. Our next award is the UO Senate Classified Staff Leadership Award, which will be presented to L. Jane Brubaker, who is in Trades Maintenance Coordinator, Campus Operations, and the presenters are Carla McNelly and Theodora Coe Thompson. Go really low. <laughs> In 2009, uh, the three Senate representatives for classified staff identified three areas of what we call three key issues. And the language of our award was crafted based on the values of our mission statement. The three areas are personal and professional development a respectful work environment and diversity. And what we were looking for is leadership uh, in advocating and a voice for classified staff in all these areas. So it's kind of bittersweet for me because Jane is a Senate representative and is going to be stepping down. And I've been working with Carla, who's also stepping down. So I have two new Senate representatives to be working with me, but this is great. Thank you. 
So I'd like to take some time and talk about Jane. It's been great working with her over the last couple of years as a senator and getting to know her um, even more than I had before is waving to her as a grounds person across campus. She's been working here over 15 years on campus doing this type of work and um, I'm sure that all of us have walked by and um, seen some of the pretties and some of the beautiful trees that she um, keeps a list of as part of her work. But I'd like to read directly from um, some of the nominations about her. She's currently serving on the UO Senate Ad Hoc Committee for Respectful Workplace. She's part of this collaboration to raise awareness of the problems that many of us face on a daily basis in our workplaces. She's one of three original university senators um, representing classified staff who began the task force last summer. Jane's continued and faithful participation in this committee representing all campus constituents working towards and cultivating and building respect and recognition to help make a, a difference towards a more supportive and um, respectful workplace environment across campus. Also, she serves as the director of the Campus Operations Diversity Committee, and the mission of the committee is to oversee the implementation of the Campus Operations Diversity Plan, and she provides leadership and support to the facilities management team towards fulfilling the plans and goals and monitor the progress towards these goals of the diversity plan. She's constantly looking for new ideas and guest speakers to engage in the efforts of this committee. Jane's continued leadership on this committee demonstrates that she embraces and respects the difference in each of us. So today we honor Jane for her peaceful, collaborative, humble, and consistent leadership in the areas of professional development, respectful workplace, and diversity on campus. Congratulations. <laughs> have to go somewhere in between here, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Carla and Theodora. I am very, very honored to have served the last two years on the Senate with these two lovely ladies. I have learned so much, and I've been so inspired by them. I am immensely honored and, hum and humbled to accept this award. It has been my privilege to serve with the Senate and, and through this past two years. There are very many classified folks across campus deserving of this award, and I know many of them personally. It would be a very long list if I were to write them all down. So this is for all of them, too. So today, I would like to say a few words about healthy soil. <laughs> Why, you ask, does this have anything to do with the University of Oregon and leadership? Well, I believe that a healthy university has much in common with maintaining healthy soils. So why care about soil? Some of you might say, oh, it's just dirt. I don't care about soil. Well, it sustains all plant life, which we depend on, and so do many other species. It cleans the water and filters pollutants. It sequesters carbon, possibly more than what is stored in large trees. It supports structures. Soil gets no respect, just like Rodney Dangerfield. Look at the expressions we use. In politics, there is mudslinging. Someone's reputation may get soiled. When there is a slanderous journalism, it's called dirt. We need to have greater respect for our soils. When we build new buildings and landscapes, we need to protect our soil. There seems to be an attitude that the soil can be easily replaced. We haul it off by the truckload and bring in lighter, sterile soil that has no life or texture. Often we have large amounts of construction, rubble, and junk left at the bottom of the planting spaces. And then we stick in a few huge trees and we wonder why they die in two years. It is very easy to destroy soil. It can happen in a few hours and it may take many years to build it back up. It can take 15 years in a wet climate to make only about a half inch of soil. Sometimes unknowingly and with good intentions, we disrupt the delicate balance, the connections between organisms when we think we are doing the right thing. We have a collective memory and a richness in our shared experience and in the wisdom of our elders that we sometimes do not draw on very well. Secondly, the biology of our soils is made up of many, many organisms, 
Each has a very important role. Over the past years, I have been a disciple of Dr. Elaine Ingham's work at OSU, which details and explains what she calls the soil food web. There are amazing relationships below the surface, mysterious and mostly invisible to the eye. Millions of tiny bacteria break down organic material and release nutrients. Tree roots are dependent on tiny strands of fungi to make intimate bonds with them and to draw in water and nutrients from the soil. And even though we only see the larger earthworms and the insects, there are millions of tiny fungi, bacteria, and other organisms present. Without them, the larger members of the food chain would never be there. We need to nurture and enrich all organisms, find ways to honor and celebrate the invisible and hardworking individuals on our campus, or we will never be able to grow large trees and beautiful rhododendrons. And isn't that what Oregon is known for? We do funny things in the horticultural world. We can purchase mycorrhizae fungi in tiny packets that we sprinkle on our trees when we plant them. There's limited research to show that this does any good, but it can't hurt and it makes us feel good. <laughs> we don't know if those fungi will stick around or if they will be compatible with the soil chemistry that's there. It is very easy to promote and invite diversity. It's much harder to maintain it over time. Thirdly, we need to occasionally aerate the soil and add new organic material, bring new life, fresh ideas. Soils get stale. Sometimes they develop a hard shell from the rain and sun pounding on the surface. This can be hard work and it can also be painful, but it does pay off. Sometimes on our campus, we need to break through the hard shells, forget the way we have always done things, and stir things up a little. Lastly, we need to test the soil periodically, and preferably before the plants show stress and the whole system falls apart. This may involve a simple pH test or sending the samples off to laboratories for more extensive tests. But sometimes the easiest way to test the soil is to take a shovel and dig down into the soil to feel it in your fingers and smell it. Good soil smells good. It doesn't stink. If it smells like a sewer, there's something wrong. There's no drainage, no airspace, and no oxygen. Anaerobic bacteria are thriving. This is not a good environment for growth, at least not for the things we want to grow. In conclusion, you can read into this whatever you like. If you are just thinking about soil, well, that's good. But I hope you will take this further and be inspired by the metaphor. Dr. Ingham says that soil health is not an end in itself. The soil needs to be evaluated by how it protects and improves its functions as habitat, sustaining agriculture, and improving water quality just as a university's health should be evaluated by how it serves its students, faculty, and staff, and the greater community. I hope you will think about what we can do as individuals and collectively as a group to feed and sustain a healthy university food web. Thank you. <laughs> The next award is the Wayne Westling Award, which is going to be presented to Andrew Marcus, Associate Dean of Social Sciences in CAS, and uh, I will be presenting that award. 
Andrew, today we are honoring you for your exceptional leadership and service to the university and to the entire community. I would like to read from the letter of nomination, which was written by Alec Murphy, professor of geography. I am writing this letter to nominate my colleague, W. Andrew Marcus, for the 2012 Wayne T. Westling Award. Andrew's record of service at the University of Oregon makes him an ideal candidate for the Westling Award. He has been an exceptionally dedicated, capable department and campus leader since shortly after he came to the University of Oregon more than 10 years ago. And through inspired leadership, he has made a signal contribution to the workings and the social climate of our campus. When Andrew came to the University of Oregon, I remember him telling me that one of the things that drew him to the U of O was the strong tradition of faculty governance here. I was not surprised when he showed a willingness shortly after his arrival to take on university as well as departmental service responsibilities. Most notably, he became involved in university senate within a few years of his arrival on campus and was elected to the presidency of that body in 2004-2005. He also served in that capacity in the spring term of 2007 to fill in for a Senate president who was unable to complete his term. In or related to his Senate president duties, Andrew served on the Senate Budget Committee, the Enrollment Management Committee, and other committees. In addition, he served on the UO Faculty Advisory Council 2005 to 2007, and then on Provost's Academic Excellence Committee. Where did you get time for anything else? <laughs> it's amazing. Just as Andrew's most intense period of university service was beginning to wind down, he stepped in to head the Department of Geography in 2008. He was an able, good-humored chair of the department for three years. During his stint as department head, he also served on the CAS Dean's Council and became involved in a variety of campus committees, including the Tuition and Fees Advisory Committee, 2010 to the present, and the Faculty Policy Review Committee, 2011 to the present. His tenure as head of the Department of Geography was so successful that Dean Scott Coltrane encouraged him to apply for the position of Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences in spring 2011. Andrew was selected for that position and began his work in the Dean's office this past fall. My sense is that his tenure as Associate Dean is off to an excellent start. As someone who has had the privilege of knowing Wayne Westling, I can say with great confidence that Andrew Marcus is the kind of person we should be honoring with an award named in Wayne's honor. Andrew has been an exceptional contributor to the university community over the last decade, both through what he has done and because of how he has done it. I'd like to read that again. Both through what he has done and because of how he has done it. And he has made these contributions while continuing to function at a high level as a scholar and educator. I think he would be an outstanding choice for the 2012 Wayne T. Westling Award. And I certainly agree and would like to congratulate you and thank you. You're really a model of service and leadership for all of us. Thank you so much. And uh, please come forward to receive your award. It's a little funny to be on the receiving end of this rather than the giving. I've twice handed out the Wayne Wesleyan Award, and it was a pleasure on, on each occasion. Uh, it is an honor, and, and it was also a total shock and a surprise to me, I have to say, that uh, when I received the email uh, from Rob, I think the subject line said something like Senate Awards, and it came in at 8.30 in the morning. I didn't read it. I thought, oh, that's good news. I'll save it for later. So I didn't open it until 10.30 that night, at which point I did a holy moly kind of reaction uh, and responded to, uh, to Rob that, yes, thank you. <laughs> it was nice to have received that notification. Uh, I want to say it's all the more meaningful this year. It's, it's been a hell of a year, hasn't it? Um, it's been a rough one for the university, but also a really good one. Uh, for me, it's been a rough one personally and, and professionally, not because it's been bad things professional, but because it's been a brand new job. Uh, and in that vein, I want to actually acknowledge Rachel, who just received an award already. I think one of the things that is so amazing about Rachel is that she is able to mentor people like me. Uh, there's not a day that goes by that she hasn't been in my office helping me, uh, guide me, uh, 
uh, keeping me from stepping into certain things that I didn't want to go into. Uh, Rachel is uh, a true uh, leader uh, in a very quiet way that uh, I've deeply appreciated. So thank you, Rachel, so much for that. Uh, it's always tough to know what to say at, at these moments. Uh, and so what I want to give you is a little bit of speeches past and present. I've talked to many of you in Senate settings. I've talked to you in uh, convocations. I've spoken to uh, alumni groups. And, and my message has always been really the same. And it's something I deeply believe in to this day. That what sets the University of Oregon apart uh, is not that we have exceptional people doing good research. We do. But so do other places. Uh, it's not that we have a beautiful campus, which we do, but so do other places. Uh, it's that this place has a culture that is radically different than any other university I've ever been associated with. And that culture is one that is truly one of a word we've heard very often today, community. Uh, it's a place where people come together to work out their differences, to find ways to move forward, uh, to really make a difference for the vision of the entire university and for the directions that we take. One of the things I've actually learned this year is that there certainly are people, I've known this before, but especially this year, people that don't feel engaged in that community in quite the same way, that they may feel alienated from institution or from administrators or from whatever particular place it may be. And that even those individuals, I find, more than other places, want to step forward and try to make a difference through the kind of collaborative endeavor that we see taking place right here in this Senate body. Uh, you know, I, I, we don't have a top-down style where we wave a wand and the dean, certainly not the associate dean, uh, steps in and things begin to change. Uh, instead, what we engage in is this remarkable but really awful, excruciating, frustrating kind of teeth grindingly terrible process uh, that we go on day after day after day that might have you in two years of committee meetings for two hours every single week. But the power of that kind of uh, process is one that truly brings inclusiveness in a way that I have not seen in other places. I think we saw it most stunningly this year uh, when we had everyone showing up or so many people showing up uh, to cheer on Richard LaRiviere and Matt Court and I think even more stunningly, to have a silence so profound that you could hear the rustled fabric as we greeted uh, Chancellor Pernsteiner. We took that a step further, without a single dissenting vote, passed radical changes to our Constitution. That just does not happen. Uh, I had a number of colleagues from other universities, in fact, from other nations that were there in that audience that day. And to a person, every single one of them would say to me, this never would have happened at my institution. For me, it was a validation of what we were about, to the fact that we really are a very different kind of place. Um, why are we so different? What, what is this culture? And here's why I would bring it back to Wayne Wesleyan and this award. I think it's because of service. Uh, I think it's what we do on our day-to-day -day basis that's so remarkable. Uh, just today, when I was throwing these remarks together right before I came here, uh, two hours of uh, the CAS Curriculum Committee meeting, which has met something like 18 times this year for two hours during the week. Uh, you know, another one of those, what you would think might be a teeth grinding uh, experiences. And yeah, we go through the bureaucracy of vetting courses. But today we just had this extraordinary conversation that went on about the quality of education at the university, how we can improve it. And we had people from anthropology, human physiology, history, religious studies, I'm missing a couple here, but the point being that we had people from across that entire campus there at that one table who were actually sharing a tremendous amount of joy around the fact that we were together at that table and we felt that we actually had an opportunity to change the, the future of this institution, the quality of the student experience, and to be honest, to better the world. Uh, that's, that's an amazing thing. One of the committees I've served on, actually chaired twice, is the wonderfully named Committee on Committees. Uh, and part of what I learned on that is the uh, remarkable numbers of committees like the one I was in today that have had that kind of influence on the university. At the time I was chairing the committee, there were 27 standing Senate committees. I have no idea what they are now, Rob, but there, there are a lot of them. Uh, as we were talking in the curriculum committee today, we sort of brought up the Wesleyan Award or someone congratulated me and then the, the topic came up of how we award people for their service. Uh, we were thinking that maybe we need to get like football helmets with little buckeyes, we can have little gold stars that get pasted onto people's heads. Uh, being a literary group, that quickly turned to let's, you know, 
make those S's, we'll have a scarlet S on the forehead of everyone who's done service, uh, which is fine until someone pointed out the S stands for sucker. Um, <laughs> the, the point being, however, that uh, I, I hope you can take it a step beyond feeling like you're a sucker if you become a, a member of a service uh, group. You know, I, I alluded to the fact that uh, our, our culture is one that's inclusive, and I shared the idea, I think, that we have a shared table. Uh, kind of ironically this year, I'm, I'm serving on the administration's team uh, negotiating with the GTFF union. Uh, and I've realized that sometimes a table can feel like a barrier. Uh, and people that I'm drinking beer with the night before at Pegasus are suddenly over there looking at me steely-eyed. Uh, and it's a funny experience. And that's made me really uh, concerned a bit about our future as we move forward in negotiations with our new faculty union. Uh, my real hope, uh, as I speak to you today, and it's been echoed already by so many people, uh, is that we not see this as an opportunity to highlight conflict, but rather as yet another wonderful social experiment that we like to engage in here at Oregon, uh, where we maybe can find a new way forward uh, for the future, something that will take us into a different kind of version of public uh, universities for the 21st century. Uh, and what's going to make that possible is going to be service, but now there's a whole new set of things that we can serve. Uh, too often we see people saying, it's not my job, uh, you know, I'm, it's bad, I'm, I'm cynical, I don't want to do it. Uh, I think the most common kind of comment is simply, I don't have the time. Well, I'll bring this to an end. I know I only had like seven minutes or something, but uh, I, I want to share with you at the end, actually, my mom's words. When I went into academia, uh, she said that she only had one request of me. She said, for goodness sakes, don't become a cynic. And she had grown up in academia and had seen what happens. It seems like we're bred to be critical. Uh, and if we aren't bred to be critical, we sure as hell train everyone to be critical. Uh, that's what we're supposed to be doing, is tearing things apart. But in that process, uh, sometimes we can apply to our own world and, and lose a sense of hope and a vision of ways of moving forward. And I, I would never want to see that happen. And in fact, I'd say the biggest threats to this university are not budgets, it's not enrollment increases, it most definitely is not unions. Uh, it is cynicism. It's going to be a lack of people continuing to participate, to be part of this service endeavor that so defines us as an institution. Uh, I've said before in this talk already, and I, I, I will say it many times in the future, that I think the University of Oregon is the place where we can define public education in the future, how it's going to happen. I believe we're there partly by circumstance. We got cut earlier than anyone else, so we've learned how to live without money earlier than anyone else. But we're also there because of this culture, because of this desire to serve this community, because we have a vision of caring that is so amazingly deep. And what I would really hope is that as I accept this Wayne Wesleyan Award with uh, true humility, that you'll take this as a moment to actually celebrate a little bit, not the cynicism we can sometimes find about our institution, but actually the deep, deep joy that we find in contributing to a place that is so remarkable. We're in higher education in the United States. We're at the pinnacle of intellectual achievement in the entire history of the human race. We're in the place that, in this nation, is going to be able to set the course for the future. I think that what's going to make that work is service. Thank you so much. Next, we'll have the remarks of the outgoing ASUO president, Ben Eckstein, and they will be delivered by Alexandra Flores Quilty, who is a senator. Hello, everyone. Um, president Ben Eckstein writes, members of the University of Oregon Senate, I apologize I am unable to attend our last meeting of the 2011-2012 academic year. However, I thank Al Senator Alexandra Flores Quilty for conveying my brief written remarks to you in person. This has been a turbulent but productive year for the university and for the ASUO. 
While this year has confronted us with all with many challenges, both expected and unforeseen, I am confident that we are ending this year stronger than we began it. In my time as a part of the University Senate, I have learned a great deal from participation in our unique system of shared governance. Among the most important lessons I have taken away from our shared experiences this year is the power of our shared investment in the mission of our university. All of our constituencies do not often agree completely on how to respond to the challenges facing our community, but our shared values empower us to engage in meaningful dialogue that respects complexity and nuance and embraces our diverse perspectives. I want to thank the University Senate on behalf of the ASUO and our constituents for your invaluable partnership in making our university a better place. While this year brought many challenges and opportunities to the ASUO and our representation advocacy for our diverse student body of 24,000, my team and I have consistently appreciated the partnership of our fellow constituents representing this body. From advocating to protect student voice in our student buildings, to fighting for increased transparency in our, in our athletic department, to pushing for strong oversight of our new campus police force, to ensuring strong student involvement in the presidential search process, it has meant so much to students to have the support of the campus community in facing some of these key issues. Without recounting the details of our agenda for this entire past year, let me thank the Senate for its support on these issues and many more. I believe that your support has been integral to the work of our association. I am incredibly proud of the work of my team this year to serve and represent students. We entered office with an ambitious agenda to make our campus a better place. And I know, thanks to their passion and dedication, this campus is a better place for all students. I want to recognize the invaluable work of our many student leaders across campus in engaging and advocating, ad, activating students to create positive change. And I want to wish the best of luck to an outstanding leader, Laura Hinman, the president-elect of the Associated Students of the University of Oregon, as she takes on her important role as a spokesperson for our student body and the chief executive officer of our $13 million student government, one of the largest and most autonomous in this country. I have been fortunate to work with Laura during my several years in the ASUO, and I hope that every member of this body has the opportunity to work with Laura throughout the year as we continue our work to serve the campus community. It has been my honor to serve students this past year, and I have been humbled to have your friendship and partnership. Thank you so much to all of you, and best of luck to the Senate in the next year. Thank you. Um, and Ben, if you get a chance to see this, um, I want to thank you for your dedication and service to um, this university, as well as your commitment um, to uh, uh, relentlessness in advocating for students. Thank you. And next, we'll have the remarks from the incoming ASUO, President Laura Hinman. Hello, University Senate. Um, and again, Ben, if you see this, thank you for your kind remarks and for all your service. And thank you, Alex, for so eloquently presenting that. <coughs> So I'd just like to first formally introduce myself and thank you for the opportunity you've given me to serve with you in the 2012-2013 school year. For the past three years, I have served as a student senator with, on the Programs Finance Committee. For those of you that don't know, the Programs Finance Committee supports the over 180 student programs that we have on campus. While our main priority as students in college is to get an education, I would argue that for me, my experience outside the classroom has served me just as much as my experience inside. A lot of what I have learned, I've learned from my role in working with programs. It has been such a rewarding experience working with the, with the student programs, spending more than 300 hours discussing one-on-one -on -one their budgets and individual issues. For some students, especially those that are involved in the student programs, their program is their safe space, their home at the U of O. Working with the Fire Society, ASUO, and Fraternity and Sorority Life, I have been blessed to work with a variety of student leaders. Nick and I believe that the, eth the ethical leadership has, should be the core of the ASUO and that it is our responsibility to aid leaders in cognitive, organizational, and professional leadership development. In addition to growing leaders, this year Nick and I will focus on increasing student program and programming fees, keeping the incidental fee on our campus while creating a sense of community, supporting building renovations, and of course working closely with you all at the exciting possibilities of local institutional governing boards. I have had the privilege of working and getting to know a couple of you this, these past couple years. 
I may have taken one of your political science or English courses, those are my majors, I might have interacted with you in one of our campus facilities or served with you on a committee when I was served as a student senator representative on um, the university committee last year. However, my favorite memories of working with you all, though, is in the various times that faculty stood in collaboration with students on issues that affected our university, like the trip up to Portland when faculty and students stood together in support of our president. I've been so amazed to witness all you, all you do, how you go above and beyond your call as professors, staff, and administrators to take on extra roles just for the betterment of our university. I believe that the work that you all do, you truly have to have a gift and a passion for both for teaching and for learning. I come from a family of educators. My grandparents were teachers, my mom's a teacher, my dad's assistant superintendent of a school district while teaching education at USC in Chapman. I know this is not a nine to five job. I know that you're all here because you love and support students. And the education is something that you all value. That's something we have in common. Nick and I are dedicated to furthering this relationship that you guys have already built. We will provide you with dedicated, knowledgeable, and excited and willing students to serve on the committees that you have included us uh, to be a part of. And we want you to know that we will always maintain an open door of communication. If you ever need student opinion or support, please reach out to us and we'll do our best to reach out to our constituents. Next year will be different. Jane touched on the fact that we shouldn't get used to what we've always done, that we should stir things up. And that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> we believe that you need to stir things up in order to create a place of excellence, not just in the ASU, but at this university. I really look forward to our collaborative discussions about the greater issues that impact our university and look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you for your time, and as always, go Ducks. Thank you so much, Laura. We look forward to working with you during this next year. Next, we have the announcement of the spring election results, which is conjoined with the next item, the introduction of the new senators. And I would like to read a list of those new senators. And please stand when your name is called uh, so we can acknowledge you. Not everyone could be here today, but uh, some people are. In any case, I would like to acknowledge them, even if they're not here. And the College of Arts and Sciences, joining us will be in natural science, Ken Prohoda, chemistry, Arkady Veintraub, mathematics, Huaxin Lin, mathematics, social science, Michael Dreiling, sociology, William Harbaugh, economics, and humanities, Gina Saki, romance languages. Hi, Gina. <laughs> That's okay, you don't have to, but we want to acknowledge you. Professional schools, triple A is Richard Margerum in Triple PM, and then Cassia Delabau in PODS, and Neil Banya, again Triple PM. College of Education, Deborah Olson, Special Ed and Clinical Services, Charles Martinez, Educational Methodology, Policy and Leadership. In the Lundquist College of Business, Jennifer Ellis in Finance, Ali Imami in Finance, and the UO Libraries, Bruce Tab in Special Collections. Officers of Administration will be joined by David Landrum, the Department of Public Safety, and finally, classified staff, John Allen, or, or Allen, excuse me if I mispronounced your name, International Affairs, and Mandy Chong, Herb Memorial Union. Please welcome them with me to the Senate. Thank you so much for your service. We're really looking forward to working with you. Um, if you want to just go down the list, uh, you'll see that the results of the elections, uh, faculty advisory council, faculty personnel committee, we were able to fill every spot in every committee, graduate council, faculty grievance appeals committee, intercollegiate athletics committee, IAC, promotion tenure retention appeals committee, PTRAC, Undergraduate Council, I see that there's quite a few uh, categories in that case. Officers of Administration Council, CAS Deeds Advisory Council. I'd like to thank everybody who signed up for service. We had a record number of people sign up. In fact, more than we have even been able to appoint to committees. Those of you who signed up, 
but have not been appointed to a committee, we will be in touch with you at some point. You can guarantee on that. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And um, we also had uh, the approval of the committee appointments, uh, which uh, these letters will be sent out very soon. And uh, here they are just to give you an idea of all of the um, wonderful colleagues who are serving now on committees, just to give you an idea of the structure of committees that we will be looking at in the 10th year review. And um, these are the newly appointed colleagues who will be serving uh, with those whose terms uh, remain to be completed. It's quite an extensive list. I believe we have 26 standing committees now. I think one fewer than when <laughs> Andrew Marcus was president. I'll even know, notice that there are names of senators in this room who are also on these committees. So thank you if you're doing service both in the Senate and on a committee or two. Thank you so much for your service. We appreciate it. And as Andrew Marcus said, this university would not be what it is without service and uh, without the efforts that all of you are making on a daily basis. Thank you so much. The next agenda point is um, motion US 11 slash 12 dash 14, the authorization to award degrees. And I will read the motion. Uh, the University of Oregon Senate recommends that the Oregon State Board of Higher Education confer upon the persons whose names are included in the official degree list as compiled and certified by the University Registrar for the academic year 2011-2012 and summer session 2011, the degree for which they have completed all requirements. I hear a motion. Second. All in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. And abstain. So moved. Thank you so much. Uh, next is the Coltrane's resolution. Emma Newen from the Climate Justice League. And you'll be, uh, is Emma here? No. You're going to present on behalf of Emma? So please identify yourselves, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Elise Downing. I'm a co-director of the Climate Justice League. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, Andrew Lubash is going to give some statements um, on behalf of the ASO Senate, and then we'll go ahead with our remarks. Can, am I being loud enough? This is good? Okay, cool. Um, so I'll just repeat myself. I'm Elise Downing. I'm the co-director of the Climate Justice League. We're a fairly new student program at the University of Oregon. Um, and Andrew Lubosch is going to present um, just a little bit of information from the ASUO, and then we'll go ahead with our presentation. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Andrew Lubosch. I am the Senate Vice President for the ASUO for one more day. <laughs> Um, and we, I just want to let you know that we passed a very similar resolution um, last week about coal trains, and it passed 14 to 0 to 2 with no nays. So that's all I have. Can you hear me? Is this good? Okay. Hi, my name is Zoe. Um, I'm a co-coordinator with the Climate Justice League's Beyond Fossil Fuels campaign, um, and I'm here today to talk about um, something that students um, in the Climate Justice League have been working on throughout this term, especially in our campaign. Um, we've been concerned uh, about some recent proposals to um, bring coal through the Northwest, specifically um, exporting it from the Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming, um, and uh, exporting it through several, several terminals. Uh, there's been one in Cherry Point in Washington. Um, the particular one that uh, we've been focusing on is in Coos Bay. Um, and as yet, uh, it's been unnamed. Um, there have been document requests by uh, local organizations trying to find out some details, um, but uh, they have been unsuccessful, have been met with um, fees, uh, lawyer fees asking um, for payments upwards of $20,000 um, instead of revealing information about these projects. Um, so what Climate Justice League has been doing um, is uh, we've been thinking of things that we can do to unite students and um, community members um, 
not in opposition of coal, but um, to bring our community together um, to say, to ask for more transparency in these sorts of issues um, and to fight for cleaner energy. Um, the Beyond Fossil Fuels campaign is certainly opposed to coal, but we're also interested in ensuring that communities such as Eugene and communities that the University of Oregon is invested in um, has the opportunity to have a say in these issues um, instead of just sort of getting pushed under the rug. Um, so what this resolution does is it's a statement um, which has already been made by the students, the associated students of the University of Oregon um, saying uh, we are opposed to coal coming through Eugene, which is what one of these coal trains would do. It would go from Powder River Basin, go from Eugene, and then would go directly to Coos Bay and then be exported to China from there. Um, and this is specifically in opposition of this passing through Eugene, which would provide no jobs for Eugene community members. It provides no benefit for the University of Oregon or its students or any of our community members. Um, so it seems like a no-win scenario. Um, does anyone have any questions about this resolution or the issue? Yeah. Uh, Anthony Hornoff, Computer and Information Science. So thank you very much for coming and speaking. Um, uh, regardless of, how, of my, qu my questions, they, they may be difficult, just hearing this, um, like what comes to mind for me is, there's, certainly there are trade-offs here. So like if they don't come through Eugene, they'll have to go through somewhere else. And if the, there are no new jobs for Eugenians, it does sound like a good thing for the state of Oregon to have a place to export coal. So it, though on the surface, the, I would certainly agree with this. It just, it seems that, that there will be, that there are bigger issues at, at stake here. Can you just comment on that, please? Yeah, sure. But again, thank you for your presentation. Um, so what I would have to say in response to that um, is that we are not working alone at the University of Oregon. Um, as the Climate Justice League, we're working along with the City Coalition. We're working along with organizations throughout the region working on this issue. And our hope is not that we're saying no to coal for Oregon or that we're saying no to this coal train for the community of Coos Bay. Um, what we're trying to say is, as a region, we want this coal to stay in the ground. Um, and that we think that every, every day that we say we yes to coal is one day that we're saying no to a sustainable energy future for Oregon um, and for our future and saying that instead of uh, continuing on with the, our old economy that we need to instead focus on finding alternatives that we know can last more than 50 or 80 or 100 years um, and, and starting that search as soon as possible so that we can have the most successful future as possible. Um, and for Oregon to say we're going to continue on with coal or we're going to reinvest in coal after deciding to close Boardman, um, our only coal plant uh, by 2020, I believe, um, that we're instead, instead of moving forward as a, as a state, we would be pigeonholing ourselves in the economy of the past. And we want to move forward beyond beyond this economy and look to the future for our state. Um, that is definitely something that we've considered. That was one of the first things that came to our minds when we were thinking about starting this campaign. Um, and we have also been working with Eugene Sustainability Commission. Um, they've raised similar concerns. Um, obviously, we have greater responsibilities as a community than just to the environment, we also have to take care of people. Um, but I think that there's a disconnect between taking care of people and coal is, it's, it's going to reach its peak soon, um, if it hasn't reached its peak already. Um, providing jobs in this way for Coos Bay, Eugene, you know, it has no effect other than the coal dust that we're gonna get in our air. Um, but for the people of Coos Bay, um, it's a short-term investment, whereas uh, holding out for, say, um, if they did biomass transport or some sort of other energy that's not coal, um, that would be a longer-term investment for them while still 
maintaining those benefits. So, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Oh, yes, Pedro. Please identify yourself before speaking. Yeah, Pedro Garcia Caro, Assistant Professor in Romance Languages and Senator for CAS. Um, to have a balanced uh, opinion um, out of the Senate and so that you do remember the occasion in a more positive light, I would like to commend your proposal and uh, to celebrate the fact that you're thinking about your future because you are the future and um, to celebrate the fact that uh, you are thinking about renewable energies and not f uh, fossil fuels so that we don't become fossilized ourselves very soon. Thank you. Any other question or comment before we make a motion? Um, would anybody like to, to make the motion first uh, that is on the screen that you've read that's been posted? I move to approve the motion as written. Second. <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Uh, are you a senator? You are, of course. And abstain? One. So um, we'll have an exact count on that, but uh, with one nay and one abstain and all the remaining senators uh, in favor, the, the motion is so passed. Thank you so much. I think this shows the Thank concern you. and activism of our students. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Really like the capes too. <laughs> um, update on unionization. Peter Keyes, member of the University of Oregon Faculty Union Coordinating Committee. Thank you for returning this meeting and giving us an update. Sure. Um, I just want to update you on what's going on with the union uh, a bit. Um, I don't think that that much has changed. Um, I should probably give a high-minded speech here since this seems to be the Senate meeting every year where we talk about community and comedy and these things. And I think, you know, sitting and listening to the comments earlier today, both from the President about the, the, how we are a community and how we need to get through this next year uh, if things start to shift, um, and then listening to some of the award recipients, so I think we're talking a lot about service and its importance to the functioning of this university. I think it's a really good lead into a way to think about where we're going with the faculty union at this point. Um, one point we tried to make constantly through the somewhat contentious couple of past months we've had has been um, this union is not being organized by a bunch of uh, outside agitators who've been shipped in from Chicago. Uh, these are your colleagues. When I look around the union organizing committee, I see many members of the Senate. I see at least three former Senate presidents. I see former deans, I see former associate deans, I see a wide range of people. I see the same people I see actually at all the other meetings I go to on this campus. Um, so it's not like a bunch of foreigners coming in and imposing on this. And I'm, I'm hoping that it seems the, the debate has sort of settled down a bit and what I'm seeing that's quite interesting to me at this point is not so much a, um, a lot of um, screaming about whether to have a union or not, but I'm seeing actual discussions of substance appearing. I'm actually seeing people talking about the issues that they're concerned with um, that they think the union might want to engage, and so I feel encouraged by that. Um, and that's what we're planning on doing, in, we're doing right now and in the near future. So as I mentioned the last time, um, uh, we're having department-sized meetings at this point. Uh, units and such are gathering and people from the unit, union organizing committee and staff are meeting with them and we're trying to basically make sure everyone understands where we stand in the process and I've got a little, I'm in, since I'm the only person in the organizing committee who can draw, um, I, I am, you know, working on the little graphic that will soon hit the streets. Um, all these people just talk words all the time. It gets very confusing. Um, and, and this will soon be out there to sort of show you where we are in the process, how it's going to move along in the next six months or so. Um, we're forming, we're also forming these working groups at this point. So a tentative list of groups in, uh, that we have um, are going to be looking at issues such as salary, uh, benefits, pensions, family and equity issues, uh, contracts, working conditions, 
um, grievance uh, things. Now, one, and there's also going to be a working group that has been formed right now to look at drawing up the uh, constitution and the bylaws for the union. And that'll be working, you know, during the summer on that. Um, we're looking for people to join all of these committees. So there will be people from the union organizing committee on each of these committees, but we're really wanting to have a broad range of people participate in formulating these possible making policy recommendations. Even we're actually leaning on people who we knew were union union opponents who were worried about where some of this might be going and trying to pull everyone into the process. Um, I, when we talk about community here, I've, I got into this thinking about the union a few years ago, um, mainly from the concerns I had on this campus and things that I thought were not working so well. And you know, I've been a member of, this, of the Senate eight out of the past 10 years. Um, I think one year as president and two years as vice president. So I'm pretty aware of a lot of the issues um, that have been going on on this campus. And I had my own concerns and my own observations. And then what's been so interesting to me on the organizing committee is hearing a whole range of other people's concerns, uh, things that they find in their jobs, the things that they find to be problematic that I had no idea about. It's been a very educational experience for me. So I see the union as it goes forward being something like this, where we all um, start, you know, the Senate meets for, you know, two hours a month, and we deal with very official things, and we deal with resolutions and things we have to do. And so there's just not that much opportunity for us to sort of talk and, and have the various constituencies that are represented here put all their issues on the table and talk about how their lives are going and how their jobs are going. Um, so I see the union as being a great place where that actually has been happening in the past couple of years. And I think um, I'd sort of echo the president's uh, feelings that we need to move forward together on this. And I think it's not going to be being Oregon where we all like to get along. I don't see it as being an incredibly oppositional uh, pounding the table. I don't think anyone's ever pounded the table in Eugene, as far as I can tell. So I would, I would like to think we're going to move forward with the same degree of cooperation. We, you know, it's all the same people we put on. I'm taking off my Senate toga at this point and putting on my union cap, but I'm also going to be on the FAC and talking about these issues. So I think it'll be the same community, the same group of people talking about issues together will just sort of be shifting a little bit some of the relationships. So um, that's where we stand at this moment. I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Frank? You mentioned policy recommendations. Yes. Uh, are you talking about policy, policies for the operation of uh, I'm, you know, I'm not talking capital P policies. I'm not right. talking, I'm talking policies sort of that the ones that the union would be wanting to put into a potential bargaining agreement. So we'll be working on formulating uh, contract language policies and recommendations and such this summer, coming up with more, you know, firm uh, agreements on that in the fall and, and basically making all of our sort of recommendations for what would be in the agreement more public at that point. Yeah. Anyone else before Frank makes another comment? Nope. Anybody else have a question? Frank. Do you envision Frank. that these policies uh, will be of significant academic uh, relevance to the operation of the university? I would think some of them would be, yes. Uh, will those then come to the Senate as uh, policies are expected to do before they uh, are approved by the president? That's an interesting question. Thank so, you. So there's a, there, I, was, I have been pushing to have a union, one of the working groups in the union uh, be uh, on governance issues because a lot of people, it, the discussion in the past year has been how a union might reinforce faculty, shared governance and, and, and even say, for example, say the Constitution is part of the contract. And, um, and I've not been successful in convincing other people in the union that we should have a working group on this. And the reason has been there's too many people who are worried that this would be seen as the union usurping some of the prerogatives of the Senate and saying that we don't want anyone to think that the union is sitting down and deciding what the governance system should be. Um, and I thought that was quite amazing. So what I, I, I'm glad to hear Rob talking about today and uh, you know, as we coordinate with this, and I think there should be some coordination between the Senate and the union as we go forward on this to see how the two bodies could work together and how the union could reinforce and work with the governance system rather than trying to take it over so, or, or ignore it either way. Yeah, I absolutely think this is essential. And um, as I've said in probably every Senate meeting since November, um, I'm committed to doing this. Um, now having been reelected, even more committed to working with the Union Coordinating Committee and would love to go to a meeting even this week if you have one, um, I mean, yes. it, or, or next week, whatever right. is best for people. But it's uh, 
great if we could start talking about it now and and just uh, work on it as the colleagues we are. Yeah. And I think I, you know, I've been tr trying to do this to be a liaison to the Senate. Um, I probably won't be doing this next year since I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I think my first Senate meeting was 10 years ago and I'm going to take a break and let all the younger folks jump in and do this for a while. Um, and, but there are other members of the union organizing committee who are on, who will be senators next year and certainly one of them could be the uh, liaison between the Senate and the union. Yeah, I think we, we need to just have a nice conversation about what will work best for everybody in terms of how to work uh, Senate and Union Organizing Committee as we go forward. And because this, from the Senate side, we don't know what all of the possibilities and strictures are, um, we need to find those out from you and then just have a good discussion about it and go forward. And I, I, I'm quite sure because I, I know that in the Senate next year there are quite a few people from Mm -hmm. the union, um, that that will make a nice liaison. I'm sure we'll be able to form whatever kind of committee or liaison committee uh, is appropriate. It's great. I, I think we're, we're embarking on a journey, and uh, the union is what we make it. I think that that's very true. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Oh, there was one more. Oh, Ken yeah, Doxey. Yeah. Yeah, the, organi the organizing committee is up on the union website. Yes, and, and I mean, not everybody who's on the organizing committee is listed there. A number of people still wanted to keep their heads down and feeling sort of pressured and such. So, but I think the, major the majority of the organizing committee is listed on the website. Could you give us the uh, URL or just the moniker? It's uauoregon.org. So, so uauoregon.org. Yep. Um, is there any other uh, information you might have about the, uh, oh, sorry, please. No, no, no you, please, you, you first, please. Jenny Ellis, Finance Department. Uh, one question, not that I'm really considering it. Who would, uh, how would one go about getting themselves on one of the working groups? Um, you could talk to me, or if actually what I could do is I think we should probably have up soon a list of who's like heading each of the working groups, and we could contact those people if there's an area in particular of in particular interest you'd like to study. Um, but I could certainly pass that information along. I would, I would appreciate you putting it online so that people can see what working groups are right. and who to contact if they want to join in. Yeah, Deb. Yeah, I, I think it's very appropriate that on the Senate website we uh, direct people mm -hmm. toward the appropriate place because there have been a lot of questions that have been coming to us, and obviously we're mm -hmm. w we're wanting to direct people appropriately. So, would that be the website is where people yes. should go? That's right. Great, we'll do that. I think that that's uh, helpful to people um, because I don't uh, personally I don't want to answer anything incorrectly. So when people ask me, I will direct them. Um, uh, one question I had was about um, the actual timeline for collective bargaining agreement. Has there been one formulated? Do we know? I mean, it's still rough, and it's it's still the one we talked about uh, last at the last meeting, which is uh -huh. sort of, you know, having a draft bargaining positions and such ready in the fall, and so that yes, fall term would definitely be the earliest we'd be considering entering into negotiations and see how long that takes at that point. And, and what would happen is that uh, something is drafted first and then negotiations begin, so it's drafting over the summer, or how does it work? It, it's basically the union be coming up with its positions and issues and such over the summer and into the fall. Fall, we'll be having a membership drive, mm -hmm. and then we, we start talking to the administration, and then you know people who are members of the union could vote on any contract that's agreed to between the administration and the union. Members could vote on it at that point. Now, has the membership been confirmed or ratified, certified? The union's existence has been certified, but there right. is no actual membership at this point. Okay, we have to, just as I said last time, you've, just because you signed a card that you wanted to have a union doesn't mean you're in the union. So you have to sign something to actually sign up for the union. And uh, When does that happen? When so well, people I th we know? think it could happen any time. You know, you could probably wander down and say, I want to join this union, and we just have to get the forms ready for people to sign up. 
but then we will have sort of the first thing in the fall, there will be sort of a membership drive where we'll you know, more try to get more people. We know that people are pretty preoccupied at this time of the year, and any cards you got in your mailbox this time of the year would be ignored. Uh, so we'll focusing on the beginning of fall term being really when we uh, try to get people signed up. One question that has also come to me, I'm just um, yeah. sharing some questions that have been asked, and I didn't have answers. So. Um, um, doesn't the collective bargaining unit have to be certified, and then, or, or not? Or has that been done? The yes, actual, it has. So all the names are clear. So if no, someone that, were to yes. go sign up, they would check it against that list. That's is that how it works? That's right. And and there's right. it's not completely clear because again, there's still uh, some lack of clarity about who's a PI, who's a supervisor. And so what the union and the administration agreed to is that for people who for whom this is not clear, that it's sort of a there's a third party process has been put in place to sort of look at and interpret state laws to who would be in the union or not. And we would probably see that but that approach continuing throughout the whole life of the union, because obviously in, in something like a university, there's people who are going to cycle in of being in the bargaining unit or cycle back out. So you're a department head, you're out. You step down as department head, you're probably back in. So uh, those kind of things, we need some kind of body to sort of look at that constantly shifting terrain of who's in the bargaining unit. Great. Any other questions or comments before we move to our last item? Gina. Gina. It wasn't, this is, I'm Gina Saki in Romance Languages. It wasn't so much a question. I just thought you might want to mention the survey piece, which is what, how we get information right. from the potential members of the bargaining unit that will help us form those. Uh, right, so that should be coming out soon. We will be sending out sort of an online survey um, email uh, to, you know, so there's two primary methods for getting information and ideas from people at this point, through group meetings, department meetings and such, and the others through an online survey where we're going to be soliciting people's input on what issues they think are important that the union should be engaging. Thanks. Great. Any other okay. questions or comments? Okay, thanks. I know. Oh. 